I'm glad to be here uh, with, with you to talk about a subject that has changed remarkably in the last several years. The topic of religion and politics, faith and politics, has gone through a dramatic sea change. I think a good one. I'd like to speak to that tonight. I have just finished this book tour for this, uh, this uh, new, new book, The Great Awakening Book, and the first night was in Portland, Oregon, where uh, Powell's, a great independent bookstore, has a, uh, they have their events in this Baghdad Theater, it's called, this old, funky, renovated place. And uh, it was first night, and it was a marquee outside. And at 7.30, had the, the book event, had my name in the marquee. And then the movie at 9.30 was also listed. I looked, and there it was, Jim Wallace, American Gangster. Uh, <laughs> so it was a great start to the whole, my wife Joy thought it was a very appropriate start to the whole conversation. Uh, but I remember uh, it was the first radio, and when you book, book tours, you're on the radio constantly. The first one, though, was in Portland. And I remember the uh, host set the tone for me for the entire book tour. She said, we need some good news. We need some good news. And the book is about revival in our history called Great Awakenings, which is really... Revivals are about good news, but not the kind of good news that ignores the bad news, but good news because of the bad news, or in the face of the bad news. So I want to suggest uh, to you tonight that we've got some, some good news I want to share with you, and then some better news. <laughs> the good news is having traveled the country now for for about three years on this subject, I really believe, it's no longer hyperbole, it's, it, I believe that in fact, the dominance of the religious right over our religion and our politics is finally finished. Is that good news to you? But the better news is, I'm not even gonna talk about them tonight. Uh, because the better news is that a whole lot of folks, particularly a new generation, are applying their faith, addressing their faith, to the biggest issues we face in this country. And that's changing the entire landscape of faith, politics, and even the issue of moral values voters. And I want to speak to that good news tonight. But it's true the church has had a serious image problem. A recent book named Appropriately Unchristian by Barna Polster, David Kinnaman, and Gabe Lyons reveals much about the millennials, the emerging generation, both inside and outside of religion. It's about how they view Christianity in particular. And guess what? The results are in, and it isn't good news. An overwhelming majority of these young people, remember both inside and outside of religion, view Christians as too hypocritical, too judgmental, too focused on the afterlife, too political in the partisan sense of the word. A lot of baggage to carry around. But, you know, if you ever tried this, I suggest trying it, I've done this, do a little focus group on the street. Pick a handful of folks, believers, religious or not, ask them what they think of Jesus, and they'll say things like compassionate, loving, caring, hung out with sinners, hung out with the poor. He was for peace. And people have this idea somehow that Christians ought to stand for the same things Jesus did. It's very weird <laughs> why they think that but it creates a bit of an image problem. The good news as the image is beginning to change, a more open, a more welcoming, a more compassionate kind of faith committed to social justice. And so I want to talk about that tonight, beginning uh, with what I would call the big idea. <laughs> There's a big idea behind this book, and it's very simple. And we'll, I'll say it, then try to unpack it a bit. The big idea is this. When politics fails to resolve 
or even address the biggest moral issues of the time. What often happens is that social movements rise up to change politics. And the best social movements almost always have spiritual foundations, almost always. So let me start with two Washington stories. They're really Washington jokes. I know outside the Beltway, folks love to laugh at Washington. So this will give you a chance to do that. One's a religious joke and one's a political joke. Now, the first story is two senators are having lunch. And I actually know uh, your senators from this state. Uh, I like them both a good deal. So there's two, two of my closer relationships up, up there. So I'm not talking about them, of course. Uh, <laughs> So one's a Democrat, one's a Republican, these senators. Of course, you know I'm making this up because they never do that anymore, you know, have lunch together and talk. Uh, but the Republican says to the Democrat, you Democrats don't get religion. You haven't got a clue. You just don't understand religion at all. Democrats, says, that's not true. We are very religious, we Democrats. We do get it. Republican says, okay, I've got a challenge. I've got 20 bucks. Says, you can't recite the Lord's Prayer right here and right now. Democrat says, yes, I can. He gets himself together, settled, centered. Okay. okay. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. Republican pulls out 20 bucks. Says, darn, didn't think you could do it. <laughs> now, that joke got told me by Richard Land, Southern Baptist member of the religious right. And even he is conceding the point now that this idea that God is on one side of the political aisle or the other is really silly and should be put behind us. God is not a Republican or a Democrat, and people of faith belong in no party's political pocket. Amen? amen. Can you do amens at the State House? Is that, is that okay? This gets going, we might have an altar call at the end. You never know. Be careful. And it is important to remember that the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. never endorsed a candidate, not once. He asked them to endorse the agenda of a movement. That's good wisdom in an election year. The second, the second joke is a political one. This man is drowning in the Potomac. He's in deep trouble. He's 100 feet offshore. Republicans rush down to the river, and they're going to save him. He's going down 100 feet offshore. Republicans throw him 50 feet of rope and yell at him, the rest is up to you. <laughs> Democrats, of course, think they can do better. They rush down. He's really going down now, the poor fellow, 100 feet offshore. Democrats throw him 200 feet of rope and then let go of their end. <laughs> it's a silly story, but it makes a point, which is this, a much more serious point. Politics is broken in America. Most of us feel that. Washington Post this week did the poll again, the are we going in the wrong direction poll. Consistent polling over decades now, now up this week to 82% of us believe the country's going in the wrong direction. Again, the big idea, when politics is failing to resolve and address the big issues, what often happens is social movements rise up and change things, big things that no one thought could be changed. So this book is about these times in our history that I've fallen in love with, these uh, Historians call them great awakenings. When the revival of faith breaks out and big things change, like the abolition of slavery, women's suffrage, child labor law reform, and of course, civil rights. Things that no one thought could change, all of a sudden, the wind changes and things happen that nobody expected. So I was studying all these movements. I knew something about them, but I didn't know nearly as much as I learned in the research on this book. And I learned, among other things, that the church historians, and I love this, the church historians say that 
spiritual renewal or conversion or religious experience doesn't get to be called revival until it changes something in the society. Which means if religion cures your addictions, thanks be to God. If it heals your relationships, mends your family back together, wonderful. If it sets your life on a new path, let's be thankful. But if it doesn't change anything in a society, the church historians say, it doesn't get to be called revival. So the historians argue about how many of them there have been. I think four. I think the black church in the civil rights movement was the fourth great awakening. I won't go through them all tonight. There's not time, but one of my favorites is the second great awakening. Charles Finney was the Billy Graham of his day. He was the preacher. He was an evangelist and an abolitionist. So I learned he pioneered the altar call, which Billy Graham later made famous. And the reason that Finney used the altar call was to sign up as converts for the anti-slavery campaign. That's why we first had an altar call, to sign people up for the anti-slavery campaign. Um, I love the idea of calling people to faith and signing them up for God's purposes in the world, right off the bat. So we were in Boston on this book tour in Park Street Church in Boston, great church right on the common there. Uh, and uh, uh, I learned that William Lloyd Garrison did his first anti-slavery speech there in the church. Now, he was secular, but if you were an abolitionist, Park Street Church was the place to be. And Charles Finney preached there on weeknights in 1831, using the altar call to call people to the movement. And so I was preaching on a weeknight, and the place was full of 20-something young believers who believe they're part of a new generation of new abolitionists focusing their faith on, well, the forgotten people and forgotten places that New York Times columnist Nicholas Kristof writes about all the time. You could feel a palpable sense of history all over again, just like Charles Finney in 1831. Same century, different continent, William Wilberforce, British parliamentarian, young man, bright rising star, got swept up in the Wesleyan revival and gave his whole political career to ending the slave trade and then slavery in Britain. It took putting forward a bill nine times before it passed. It took 30 years to end slavery in the UK, and when it finally happened, Wilberforce died three days later because his work was done. Now, a movie came out this year called Amazing Grace. You might have seen the movie about Wilberforce, and Albert Finney played, uh, played John Newton, the great uh, songwriter, Amazing Grace, how sweet sound saved a wretch like me. Well, this brother was really a wretch. He was a slave trader, and he came to faith, and he became an abolitionist. And, and the movie portrays Wilberforce well, but it misses the movement, the prairie fire that swept the UK that made Wilberforce possible. It's not just great individuals, it's movements. So this year I got to go to the State of the Union as a guest. For the first time, I was in the balcony watching uh, the whole thing live. I always watch it on TV. And as I peered over the balcony, before the TV comes on, it's quite amazing what occurs. Now, my wife is a Church of England priest, one of the first women ordained 15 years ago, Episcopal now here, she's English. And, and she's taught me about uh, processing. You know, I'm kind of low church in my background. <laughs> Something in common there with Bill Clinton, I think, I'm low church. And when I'm preaching in an Episcopal service and I'm processing, I gotta hang on to the robe in front of me so I end up in the right seat, you know? And I was in the Grace Episcopal Church uh, Cathedral this this book tour, and the, my wife said, they're kind of high church, which means, she said, smells and bells. And so, <laughs> and it was Chinese New Year, so they were, we were processing with dragons, you know, it was, but I ended up in the right place. Well, I'll tell you, these 
members of Congress put the Episcopalians to shame when they process. I mean, first the members of Congress process in, then the senators, then the, the justices of the Supreme Court, then the joint chief staff, then the president. Of course, he sit up, it's up, down, up, down, up, down. It's like high church Washington, you know? And I looked over the railing, and I, I know I saw them scurrying around down there. I know many of these characters, and I like some of them. Um, um. <laughs> but it struck me as never before that I think they think that they are the center of everything, that it all flows to and through them, that history really changes there. They're the ones, the masters of history. They are the ones who change things. But to see, history doesn't bear that out. History suggests that it's grassroots movements, social movements, that change politicians more than politicians change history. Remember, Lyndon Johnson wasn't a civil rights leader until Martin King and Rosa Parks made him one. Now, I don't know who your favorite candidate is this election, I might guess, uh, being where we are. But we aren't taking a poll tonight, but I want to say whoever your favorite is, they will not be able to change the big issues in this country that are at stake unless and until there are social movements pushing and pressing from the outside. I know the two Democrats running. I would call them both friends. I trust their desire to change things. But I know, and I think they know, they won't be able to without that kind of movement pressing from the outside. The formula for social change historically is, is movements pushing on open doors. So work for Organized for, pray for open doors in places of political power, but no open doors by themselves. Don't open the door to change. Only social movements can do that. We have some, what you might say, wicked challenges. I mean, we've got three billion people, half of God's children in this world, now living on less than $2 a day. That's when half of the population of the planet live on less than the cost of a cup of Starbucks coffee. As Prime Minister Gordon Brown in London would say, that world is neither just nor secure, nor safe for our children. The degradation of the environment David Gergen, a colleague of mine at Harvard, was on CNN the other night, one of the primary commentators, and, and I was struck at the emotion in him one night when he said, the crisis of climate change is so severe and growing so much more quickly than we thought it would, and yet the measures we will need to reverse this, even slow it down, would be political suicide for any candidate to suggest. What do we do with that disconnect, says David Gergen, a very established political commentator. Pandemic diseases like HIV AIDS and all the things the Clinton Foundation tries to take on. Uh, uh, around the world, um, 30,000 children dying every day now because of hunger and disease, what Bono calls stupid poverty, and utterly preventable disease. 30,000 kids every single day. That's one every three seconds. My son Luke, who's nine, friend of Hillary Clinton's, um, it tries, he's been trying this has broken through to him in the last uh, few months, and the other night he was trying to work this out in his prayer life, as kids do sometimes. So we were doing prayers, and uh, I got a five-year-old and a nine-year-old, and we're just doing prayers like usual, and he says, uh, Dear God, I pray that those children don't die again.
again tomorrow. And he pauses and says, but that's unlikely. So I pray that it would be their best day ever, though it probably won't. So dear God, help us to stop this from happening. Help us to stop this from happening. Doesn't make the headlines, ever. Or the cultural assault coming from these, you know, uh, I'm probably more sensitive now that I've got young kids. The sort of the cultural assault of these utterly destructive values seems aimed now at my nine-year-old and five-year-old. And if you're a parent, uh, whether you're a liberal or conservative, parenting has become a countercultural activity in America. That's how it feels if you're a parent. Uh, uh, and finally, the exclusive use of war to fight evil. There is real evil in the world, but the exclusive use of war to fight it has compromised our moral integrity and left our children less safe than they were before. But these issues, these issues, challenges are like, as you listen to them, they, they're like mountains. They're daunting. They're too much for us. They're overwhelming. They're beyond our capacity to respond, we feel. Uh, they do feel like mountains, and they are. They're mountains. But the Bible says that if you've got faith the size of the grain of a mustard seed, what can you move? Oh, well, biblically literate crowd tonight. <laughs> You can move mountains, so movements are in the mountain-moving business. That's the whole point. That's the whole point. It's these issues become matters of faith, because that's historically what it's taken to resolve them. Every major social movement that has taken on these big issues in the past and succeeded has always involved people of faith. Always. Never been a successful progressive social movement that didn't involve people of faith. No, it's never just people of faith. Never. It's always other folks coming alongside out of moral sensibilities and convictions and uh, now there's a whole new movement that, you know, the spirit, have you met these folks? I'm spiritual, but not religious. It's a, it's a movement on the West Coast. It's a new denomination on the West Coast. Spiritual, but not religious. Ben Cohen, you know, Ben and Jerry's ice cream. Ben said, Jim, I'm, I'm spiritual, but not religious. I said, Ben, offer him free ice cream. You could be the bishop of this thing, you know? So, <laughs> so it's always going to be people coming alongside, but, but people of faith have to get engaged. So I'm saying in, in the book, after every one of these big issues, uh, there's a section called the commitment, and it's at three levels, personal, communal, or congregational, and public policy. Always all three. The civil rights law in 64, voting rights in 65, those decisions came after millions of personal commitments were made and communal courage taken. And out of that comes public policy change, but it always starts with what's close to home our own closest relationships, what we teach our children, what they see us doing, what they learn by what we do, not just what we say, who their play dates are with, where we live, how we understand each of us, our work, our vocation, our resources, our lifestyles, our basic choices. If we aren't doing this personally, don't lobby your member of Congress. It's got to start at home, and then communal, congregational. We're supposed to be congregations, synagogues, and mosques, and churches leading by example in neighborhoods. I was in Ohio before we did a, our first justice revival there three weeks ago, Columbus, Ohio. I met the churches there about three months before. And I met these uh, 14, they call them the large church pastors. I mean, when they say large, they mean churches, four to 8,000 members, black and white mega churches in Columbus, big churches. And they told me about lives, people coming to church, and lives being changed and 
transformation. It was wonderful stuff. And I was impressed, but then I said, but I feel a disconnect. A disconnect. Yeah, because I hear about flourishing churches in a failing city. Flourishing churches in failing and broken neighborhoods. I told them the story of my good friend Jeff Brown, black Baptist pastor in Boston, where one Saturday night a young man was shot to death on the steps of Jeff's church when nobody was there. And Jeff and the church had to ask, are we responsible for what happens on our steps when none of us are here? They decided they were responsible for the steps and the neighborhood and the city of Boston. These pastors didn't know what to do. They were losing the battle on the streets, so they were looking for advice. And Jeff talked to a young heroin dealer. He said, you tell us what we're doing wrong. The kid says, it's easy, Rev. I mean, in that critical period, you know, 4 o'clock to 12 o'clock, for kids and their lives, we're there, and you're not. Mama sends Johnny out for a loaf of bread, corner store. We're there in the corner and you're not. So you know what? We win and you lose. It's as simple as that, Rev. That led to the formation we called the, the Ten Point Coalition where they took to the streets. Three years later, a 70% drop in youth homicide in Boston. And the police chief gave credit to the Ten Point Coalition for the change. So I asked the Ohio pastors, I said, do you have a parish? Do you have a parish? Is Columbus your parish? You know the old idea of the parish, St. Catharines were responsible for these 12 square blocks? Whether or not the people are Catholic or believers or whatever they are, we're responsible for these 12 square blocks. This is what God's given us. Jeremiah says, seek the welfare of the city in which you're placed. For in its welfare or in its healing, Will you find your own? It's called parish. Well, they all signed up for the justice revival. And three weeks ago, we had our first in Columbus, and three nights of preaching, 10,000 people came, half under 30. And the second night was the call to community, to Columbus, the parish, and to the poor children of that city, one in four of whom are poor. And I got joined on stage spontaneously by 50 pastors, the entire spectrum, most liberal, the most conservative, holding their hands up, asking the city to make Columbus their parish. Governor Strickland came the next day to our leaders meeting. The mayor of, of the city came of Columbus. Superintendent of schools came. African-American woman of faith asked for a 1,000 mentors for inner city kids in Gotham. communal, and finally public policy, because you can't keep pulling bodies out of the river and not send somebody upstream to see what or who is throwing them in. You know, uh, Catherine Booth, William Booth, Salvation Army founders used to say, you can't keep picking up bodies at the bottom of the mountain and not climb the hill, so he was pushing them off the edge. Budgets are moral documents. They reflect the priorities of a family, a church, a city, a nation. And we've got to change our priorities. We all feed lots of people, you know, our congregations do, but when they do a 5% cut in nutrition programs in Washington, D.C., it effectively wipes out all the feeding programs of all the religious communities combined. And it doesn't even make the papers. Policy is important. It was to Wilberforce, was to Finney, was to King, and should be to us. So we are looking now for what might happen in our time. So I never really read at book readings, but I'm going to read the last paragraph of this book uh, because it says where I think we're going. 
the writing and the praying and the vocational discernment got all mixed up in the last year or so for me, and this is what's come out of it. Imagine something called justice revivals. In the powerful tradition of revivals past, but focusing on the great moral issues of our time. Imagine powerful preaching and music at night with marches in the streets during the day. Imagine linking the tradition of Billy Graham with the tradition of Martin Luther King Jr. Imagine a new generation of young people catching fire and offering their gifts and talents and lives in a new spiritual movement for social justice. Imagine disillusioned believers coming back to, to faith after many years of alienation while seekers discover the power of faith for the very first time. Imagine a revival of faith that didn't result in sectarian warfare but rather new dialogue, respectful dialogue, between our diverse religious communities and a new interfaith collaboration around the crises that affect us all. Imagine politics being unable to co-opt such a revival, but being held accountable to its moral imperatives. Imagine social movements rising out of spiritual revival and actually changing the wind of our culture and our politics. Imagine a fulfillment in our time when the words of the prophet Amos, let justice, he said, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. I was invited to speak at a place, unusual place for me, not a great uh, uh, institution like this uh, or a church or a uh, university, but Sing Sing Prison by the inmates. Prisoners wrote, said, come talk to us. It sounded interesting, so I wrote back, said, well, when do you want me to come? And this young prisoner, young brother, writes back on behalf of his colleagues. He says, well, we're free most nights. <laughs> he says, we're kind of, a, kind of a captive audience here. And uh, so we went and worked out the details. The warden gave us a lot of freedom. So I had 80 guys by myself for five hours in the bowels of that infamous prison. And one of them said that night, he said, uh, you know, Jim, all of us here at Sing Sing are from just about four or five neighborhoods in New York City. The whole prison, four or five neighborhoods. It's like a train, he says. You get out when you're nine or ten years old in my neighborhood. The train ends up here at Sing Sing. But he had this young man a, a conversion inside behind the walls and the New York Theological Seminary teaches Masters of Divinity inside the walls of Sing Sing Prison. You graduate when your sentence is up. I did the Georgetown commencement last spring. I'm doing the Sing Sing commencement this spring. Yeah. And this young man looked at me and he said, you know, when I get out, I'm going to go back and stop that train. So I'm in New York a couple years later, and guess on a big town meeting on poverty, guess who's up front? Back home trying to stop that train. Here, when you're in jail in this country, you're often always, you're often already poor. Now you're in the bottom of the bottom, and these young guys figured out the most important thing, that faith is for the big stuff. The things that are beyond us and too big for us and more than we can handle. That's why we call it faith. Fast moving urban trains. A world divided between haves and have nots. These are matters of faith. You know, people like us, I, when I was growing up as a kid, they told me in my little evangelical church the big choice was, was between, was between um, uh, belief and secularism. That was the big choice. We were the believers, and then there was these people called secular humanists, and they were going to eat your children. <laughs> That's not the big choice. There are issues there. The big choice, though, is different for us. People like us, people who come out to evenings like this, who care about these issues. You already, I trust, care about these issues. You wouldn't have come tonight if you didn't care about the issues. But we have a choice to make, and it will determine whether or not there is a awakening in our time. It's a choice, a spiritual choice between two things, hope and cynicism. I like the cynics. They don't see the world through rose 
colored glasses, but realistically, cynics see the world as it is, and cynics are always against the bad stuff. They really are, but they don't think, I mean, they tried to change things for a while. They got out there and they did some stuff, and, but it got, it was tiring, and, 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 and it wasn't working, and they began to feel a little vulnerable out there. They withdraw to a place called cynicism, where you're still against the bad stuff, but you don't think it could ever change. So your cynicism becomes a buffer against commitment. Hope, on the other hand, is not a, a feeling or a personality type or a... Uh, hope is a decision. It's a choice you make because of this thing that we call faith. The writer of Hebrews says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Or my best paraphrase of that is, hope means believing in spite of the evidence and then watching the evidence change. That's what movements have always done. Let me close with a story. Um, when you're on a book tour, you get to go back to a lot of places you love. And one place that I love to be is Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia, the home congregation of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. And I remember the last time I was there before this, uh, this spring, uh, Joe Roberts was there, still pastor, not retired yet. He welcomed me back. He says, welcome. You've been to the old Israel, the old Auburn Avenue Church. This is the new Israel, the brand new sanctuary full of 2,000 seats, but it felt intimate that night, even though there were so many people. And he reminded me of my first time there many years ago on the first legal holiday of Dr. King's birthday because Ebenezer had a, a, a service to mark the occasion uh, for justice and peace. And they invited this young white preacher to come. And I was honored but terrified at the invitation because I have to be in that pulpit, that pulpit, that historic pulpit, which I was so awed by and I was afraid of how I would feel. And sure enough, I got into the pulpit where Martin King Jr. used to preach and his daddy, Daddy King, and the whole movement, and I just froze. I just froze at the history of the place, and I was more than a bit tepid when I said something like, well, Martin Luther King Jr., he was for justice and p -p 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 peace, and p -p -p probably we should be too. It was powerful, really powerful. You know? <laughs> Lower left side, a voice boomed back at me. Oh, help him, Lord, help him! Come on, you man, you're supposed to preach. Come on now. And so I did, a little bit. Oh, you're not there yet. You're not there yet. He welled me. He mercied me. He amened me till I was prancing and preaching and sweating. He just pulled the sermon right out of me. I was exhausted and spent by the end, and I rushed down. He was Deacon Johnson, the amen corner of Ebenezer Baptist Church. I said, you, 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 just, you just pulled that sermon right out of me. He stood up tall. He's past now, Deacon Johnson. But he stood up tall, and he said, put his hands on my shoulders, and said, that's okay, young man. I've raised up many a preacher in my time. <laughs> and it struck me that night that that's what pulpits can do. That's what religion can do. Religion can, can ra raise up our worst stuff. It really can. Our prejudices, our, our, our fears, our, our divisions, our hatreds, our, 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 our violence. Religion can pull up our worst stuff, and it has, but religion can pull up our best stuff. Our compassion, our hunger for justice, our willingness to listen to people who are different than we are, and our desire for peace We've had too much bad religion. It's time in America for some good religion. The kind, the great awakenings always rose up among us because they understood and we must understand that hope means believing in spite of the evidence and then watching the evidence change. Thank you very much.
Okay, we have time for some questions. Would you please uh, raise your hand? And uh, do we have microphones in the back? We've got microphones right here. All right, we've got a young man right here at the back. Hi, uh, my name is James Mitchell. I'm a student at the Clinton School. I want to say thank you very much to speak with us today. Thank you. Uh, my question is, why do you think it is that the comments of Reverend Jeremiah Wright has caused such a political firestorm, but the comments of Ted Hagee have been largely overlooked by the media? Funny thing, that. I was asked last night in Austin, um, I've known Barack for 10 years. I've known Jeremiah Wright also uh, for a long time. And I've been on the phone all week with the black churches, uh, leaders. It's, it was, it's kind of my own home because when I was kicked out of my little church at 14 over the issue of race, I got taken in by black churches in Detroit. And it's still where I call home. And we see, you know, there's a real generational, some unfortunate uh, events produced a real generational kind of uh, painful family conflict now uh, within the churches. And as has been said, there is a generation uh, for whom uh, uh, frustration and anger and legitimate grievance uh, and rage has often shaped a prophetic kind of preaching where the pastor has the responsibility of every week ministering to people who feel beaten down all week long, of naming the condition that beats them down. But sometimes rage runs over the banks of the river, as I was thinking today about that. And uh, some things were said that were unfortunate and attributed to his, his uh, most famous parishioner. But then, uh, God has his purposes and that prompted Barack Obama to give the best speech on race in Philadelphia we've seen in decades. And I've just say, to say, said to people, uh, just watch that speech. Watch it with your kids. And ask if this is the kind of vision of, of a more perfect union that you would like for your kids. Ask them what they would like. And then decide on that basis. So it's been raging, of course, and it's been hard for uh, everyone involved, and at the same time, John Hagee, who I, uh, I don't know John Hagee, but I know his work, <laughs> and uh, the most outrageous things, I won't repeat them all here, but just somehow the media gave him and John McCain, who he's endorsed a pass on that. I'm glad for the apology yesterday. I really am. I mean, I believe in forgiveness. I try to be a per person of faith, and I don't want to hold McCain responsible for everything John Hagee has said any more than people should hold Barack Obama responsible for everything Jeremiah Wright has said. But there ought to be, as the question suggests, some, some fairness and a level playing field here. And finally, most of us think the issues facing this country are a lot more serious than what somebody's pastor or advisor thinks about anything. All right, next question. Do we have a question over here? I thought I saw a hand raise over here. I guess I did not see a hand raise over here. Got one right back here in the back, right in the middle. Hello, I'm Kimberly Roth. I'm a co-editor for JesusManifesto.com and also participated in the 2006 Pentecost Conference. Thank you. So, um, you touched on this briefly, but Senator Clinton was asked at the Compassion Forum if it's possible for people of faith or of no faith to impact our, the crises in our globe um, without making personal lifestyle changes. And I just wanted, her answers were very vague, so I wanted to hear yours. Well, um, I was at that forum, actually, and... Uh asked a question on that occasion myself. I, I, I remember the question, it was a good question. And um, I had breakfast this morning with one of our former interns in Austin now, and she's gonna do uh, uh, 
uh, theology and public policy at Vanderbilt in the fall. And, um, and she's really gotten into what she calls the ethics of food. And she explained to me uh, something called food miles, which I'd never heard before. The average tomato travels 1,500 miles before it reaches our plate. And how things like uh, 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 you know, local, eating locally and eating seasonally are not just sort of um, kind of cool, hippie lifestyle habits, but affect global warming, affect transportation. So clearly, what I was trying to say before was our personal choices, I think, do undergird our political values. And I, this isn't just sort of, it's a consistency issue, it's an integrity issue, it's also a momentum issue. We lose public policy battles because we don't have the kind of cultural energy or momentum to really, uh, what I call, change the wind. Uh, members of Congress, um, uh, I often talk to folks who come to lobby them, you know, before they go up there. And I often, often say, L I don't want to waste your valuable time here in Washington, D.C., so let me tell you how to recognize a member of the Congress. They're the ones who walk around up on that hill with their, their fingers up in the air like this, and they lick their finger and put it up in the air to see which way the wind is blowing. And we think, I want to say, elections are very important. This one is especially important. But we have the mistaken idea that replacing one wet finger politician with another changes a nation. And King and Gandhi knew that you change a nation by changing the wind. Change the wind. It's amazing how quickly political Washington will follow a change in the wind. So these personal choices are not just private ones. They're public choices. And together they mount up to momentum and cultural shifts. The right has been better about this than the left. The right has figured out, you want to change policy, change the culture, and that'll change policy. The left too often has said, let's go right for the policy, and they're losing the cultural battle. So we have to change people's mindset, their hearts, change the wind, and then policy comes after that. So I think those changes are important. And this is where I think younger people my son Luke the other day, we were driving someplace and this truck was just spewing stuff into the air. And then, and then there was this, uh, have you ever seen a Hummer limo? They're, they're quite extraordinary. Well, there's one there. Luke says, what a bad place this is right now for the environment. And he's nine years old, you know. So the new generation, I think, is more sensitive and will, I think, make the connection more than perhaps my generation has. Questions? Betty Caldwell has a question right up here. Let me, let's get your microphone here so people in the back can hear you. Okay, well, thank you for coming. Thank you, Betty. Everything you said. I was very intrigued by your story about the hours, five hours in Sing Sing. And we have never been able to decide in this country whether prison is for punishment or for rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. But all of those, I guess they were men in Sing Sing, had women and children who are on the outside, and many of them are totally left without resources, mm -hmm. and wondered if any of the churches nationally are mobilized to try and help this very important left out group. It's a very important issue. Thank you, Betty. Um, the percentages are, enor are enormous. <laughs> and what happens now, uh, reentry has become a huge issue in many poor communities. I know churches and faith-based organizations who get just overwhelmed by floods of, of returning prisoners with nothing for them. And now it's so difficult to get a job if you've got a prison record. So a lot of, two, two hopeful things though. A lot of churches are getting into what they call prison ministry. Sometimes just visiting and so on, but it leads to relationship and contact and then interaction with the prison system. And I had a dinner last week um, uh, at the invitation of some of this nation's uh, political conservatives who I hang out with a place like Renaissance. <laughs> and, uh, and they've said to me, you know, we'd like to do something together that might surprise and even shake up politics. You might be surprised to know that because we're Catholic, we're against the death penalty. These are names that you would know. 
And we've decided that we're going to do something together that will be launched after the new administration, wh whoever that is, comes in on prison issues, prison reform and the death penalty. This is an issue that could, could be a cross-cutting issue of left and right. These aren't left, right. Left and right are political categories, not religious categories, not even moral categories. So I'm more and more drawn to cross-cutting issues like that. You know, I have, I have, um, I have done some prison ministry, um, some voluntary and a little bit some involuntary, uh, in terms of some nonviolent civil dis disobedience over the years. And, and I remember one time I was in the D.C. jail, and the gymnasium had been turned into another jail room because of overcrowding, and a hundred guys in a makeshift gymnasium and bunk beds sharing one toilet. And there were kids in there that didn't look older than 15 to me. I guess they had to be older, but they didn't look older. In there for things like bus transfer violations. Uh, had never yet been to court three months later. Had lost the number of their public defender. And I'd go outside and have to tell grandmother what had happened to the, the boy that she was raising and never had heard from. Now, liberal or conservative, you know that that's just going to make this kid into a much tougher kid when he gets out than when he went in. So these are issues that we have, have to confront, I think, as moral questions. And I think the churches could, and the congregations, and many mosques, I want to say, many, many, many uh, Muslim congregations have done a, I've been in, in those, in D.C. jail or places, and there's some real powerful things going on from, from Muslims inside those jails. So I think this is something we could collaborate on and make a difference on it, and we, and we have to. A few Questions? more? Right here in the back, Dennis. You mentioned the uh, spirituality movement in California being rather large, and in this global flattening world, world religions are butting up against each other much more than they ever have before, evidence in Iraq and Middle East. Do you think the spirituality movement being non-religious possibly could help coordinate world religions coming together and talking to each other in a way differently than they've ever had? There are two great hungers in our world today. The hunger for spirituality on the one hand, the hunger for social justice on the other hand. The connection between the two is the one the world is waiting for, especially a new generation. And I have been over the last, since 9-11, there has been more and more conversation between uh, not just people who want to talk about spirituality, but even faith leaders across boundaries like we hadn't before. Uh, Davos, the World e Economic Forum, I've attended that now for several years in a row since 9-11, and at first, these are like business people and uh, heads of state, and first, after 9-11, they're worried that, you know, this religious conflict might interrupt the business climate, so we got to get people together to talk. But the more we talked, the more that it was a conversation that affected things like, uh, I, was, I did a seminar on, shall we despair, should we despair of our disparities? Uh, uh, does global inequality, is that a religious and a moral issue that affects things like security? And of course, it, it is. And so I think there is a new conversation under the level of the radar screen going on. It's often a conversation between the fundamentalisms of, of all of our great religious traditions, which are remarkably similar. In Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, there are fundamentalisms in all our traditions. Karen Armstrong writes about this very uh, persuasively. Then there's the prophetic tradition in all those same Traditions, which I think is the counterpoint. The answer to bad religion is not necessarily secularism. The answer to bad religion is often better religion. And so a religious dialogue, I think now, is imperative, both inside the traditions and outside as well. Annie, you've got a question right here. Right behind you, Annie, there's your mic. I was in the audience when you spoke there in Ebenezer. Bishop Tutu was there with Mandela's two daughters. My question is, 
in your experience as becoming a global motivator for people to look inside, what experiences impacted you, you believe, spiritually to be the giant that you are today? I had the same question that I asked to Bishop Tutu, and I also asked Mandela. I'd like to know what were those experiences that developed you to be the giant that you are today? I had a recent experience uh, with um, uh, Bishop Tutu's daughters are such a credit to, to him, and I, I was I'm getting to know Naomi especially. And uh, I've kind of, um, as a parent of two young boys, I have just admired how uh, Bishop Tutu, in the middle of his busy public life, was able to raise uh, these young women with such a quality of, of heart and spirit. I hope we can do as well, Joy and I, with our, our boys. Um, I think what, what really, the real question is what sustains you. That's the real question because, you know, you have, uh, we all have successes and failures and things rise and fall, and what sustains us over the long haul is really the question. And I think that a social activist can't, can't continue to be an activist for a long time unless they also are working at becoming a contemplative. Uh, uh, Bishop Tutu, when I got to know him, I was struck by his faith as much by his political courage. And I remember he told me one time that he got this letter from a group of cloistered women in a monastic community somewhere in Missouri who wrote him and said that they got up every morning at 4 a.m. to pray for him. And he said, "Why? how could I be afraid of P.W. Bota when those women are praying for me every day? You know, bring it on, you know. And, uh, and, and uh, he always traveled with a chaplain. Uh, and I, I, this book talks about how for King and at the kitchen table one night in Montgomery, how his academic and seminary faith wasn't enough to f face the death threats he was getting. And Daddy's faith back in Atlanta was enough. And Mama, he had a, God had to become real for him, personal and real. And I think... I think uh, when I talk to young people these days about, we have this emerging leaders program of under 30 activists, and I get to speak to them every year, and I just say three things. You've got to take care of your faith. You've got to take care of each other. And you've got to think movement. You know? and, and for me, over the years, it's been people that have taken time to try and take care of me and my faith, and mentors and elders are really important. And I think, um, you know, Hope comes for me when I see the kind of faith that I get to see. I'm spoiled and blessed. I get to see some of the best things going on in the world. I've seen too many, you know, I was there for Nelson Mandela's inauguration, and I saw how history just changed in a day. And, and that was the kind of faith being rewarded. Tutu used to say we are prisoners of hope. That wasn't some kind of eccentric old man. He just knew how history changed. This is the dynamic of history. So the hope to me is the crucial thing. That is the one thing that we have to offer that movements most need. Everything else we can fundraise for, but the hope is really the critical thing to keep, keep alive. We have time for one more question. Right here, Heather. Hi, I'll follow the tradition of saying my name is Heather Hahn, and I'm the religion reporter at the Arkansas Democrat Gazette. And I have an nice odd to meet you. It's a pleasure to meet you, too, sir. I have an odd question for you. Um, we're putting together a list of individuals' favorite Bible verses, and I'd like to know what your personal favorite Bible verse is. Well, that's an easy one for me. Um, I was in the student movement. I had been kicked out of my church at 14, and got involved in civil rights struggles and anti-war movements and uh, was reading, you know, at that time we all were Ho Chi Minh, Che Guevara, Karl Marx and all the rest. And I just wasn't satisfied with what I was finding and I went back to the New Testament, uh, having now grown up in the movement. And, and I began to read and the book of Matthew and I got to the Sermon on the Mount, which just turned everything upside down. I, I had never heard a sermon 
ever in my life in my church on the Sermon on the Mount because they said that was for another dispensation. It was for when we get to heaven. And at 14, I thought, you know, blessed are the peacemakers. I think we need that now, uh, not later, you know, but they didn't seem to feel that way. But I, I read this now after years of organizing and being tear gassed more times than I could count and all the rest. And then I got to the 25th chapter of Matthew. And that became for me my conversion text. Never anything more radical than that that I'd ever read. When Jesus says, I was hungry, I was thirsty, I was naked, I was a stranger, I was sick, I was in prison, and you never showed up. You weren't there for me. And they all thought they were his followers. And I said, well, when do we see you hungry and thirsty and naked, a stranger and sick and in prison? And they were kind of saying, if we'd known it was you, we would have done something. We would have at least formed a social action committee. You know? But he says, as you've done to the least of these, in one translation says, who are members of my family, you've done to me. Which means, I'll know how much you love me by how you treat, those, treat them. Those who are left out, outside, forgotten, abused, uh, no one pays any attention to. They're the test. They're the test of our love for God. And uh, when I got to Washington, D.C., you know, I met this wonderful woman in my neighborhood who became an elder for me. She was formally uneducated, but she knew she was my spiritual elder. Mary Glover was her name, and she used to always pray before we, we had a little food line. This is like 10 blocks, 20 blocks from the White House, and hundreds of people line up, line up for a bag of groceries. It's quite a metaphor in this powerful city. And before they come in every day, we all, Saturday, Saturday morning, we all would hold hands, and and she'd offer the prayer because, you know, she was our best prayer. I mean, she prayed like she knew to whom she was talking, you know. Like she'd carry this conversation with her Lord for a long time. She'd pray, Lord, thank you, Lord, for waking me up this morning. Thank you that the walls of my room were not the walls of my grave. My bed was not my cooling board. Thank you, Lord. And then she prayed this prayer. She said, Lord, now they're about to come inside, all these folks, families, to get a bag of groceries. And all the volunteers needed a bag of groceries, too, to take home. She'd say, Lord... We know that you'll be coming through this line today. So, Lord, help us to treat you well. Help us to treat you well. I've read every commentary in Matthew 25 that I've ever could find. That was the best commentary I'd ever seen. Because she, she got it. Like those guys at Sing Sing, she got it. And people like that hold life together for neighborhoods like mine. And so my text is the 25th chapter of Matthew, because um, uh, that helped me to finally get it. And uh, the, we said we loved Jesus in my little church, and we were keeping him at arm's length the whole time and didn't even know it. We were keeping away the very people that Matthew 25 talks about. We thought we loved Jesus, and we just never got close enough to him to know who he was. And uh, I was in Nashville for the God's Politics thing. In Nashville, you don't do a book lecture, you do a, you do a concert. So Jars of Clay, Buddy Miller, Emmylou Harris, Ashley Cleveland, they all sang and I preached. We do the Bellacourt Theater twice in one night. Next morning, I get an interview by a guy who says, I'm a secular Jewish country music songwriter and disc jockey, but I love your stuff. <laughs> he said, it's a movement, I think, and I, I, you got to have a name, though. i got a suggestion for a name. He said, uh, call yourselves the red letter Christians. All that stuff Jesus said, the red stuff in the Bible, he said, I love the red shit. <laughs> he said, the rest I can do without. Now, I'm an evangelical, so I want, before the record, I love all of it. I love all of it. It's all wonderful. But we've got to get back to the red stuff, the red stuff like Matthew 25. And the red stuff is what makes revival. Thank you very much. Let's give him a big hand. I'm going to let you...